want to just welcome everybody. This is being recorded. I'm very excited to introduce Wade, um, who I think among a lot of the people who are joining, they already know you. We got a lot of registrations that I think came from your network. Once, once you liked my post, it really kind of took off. Uh, which is incredible to see that happen. We, we were way, we were getting registrations every like 10 minutes after you like the post. Um, so you've got some fans out there, but I want to, uh, before we introduce you, I want to introduce the audience. We're going to have the NerdWise team, which is about 13 people all over, you know, the United States, Canada. We've even got team members joining from South Africa. Um, our number of our customers are going to join. And then the Wade Burgess fan club. And then also, um, Dana Jensen, who is a new NerdWise team member uh, and a former LinkedIn account manager, is also very excited uh, for this. She um, she says hello. Dana, are you on yet? Anybody? Oh, we got Dana with uh, some connection issues, but I think that was Hey Wade. Um, so we're going to do 20, 30 minutes of catching up with Wade. Uh, Wade would love to just kind of, I'm going to ask you a couple questions around what got you into this, this line of work and where you are today. Uh, and then we will open it up for questions and answers. So um, just quickly introducing Wade, I feel like, and this is probably not completely true, but that in, in, it, from the outsider to a lot of people, it kind of seems like LinkedIn is what launched you, know, you to the moon. But from what I saw, I, I mean, you were, it was almost like you were able to navigate LinkedIn and grow and, and, and kind of make the moves uh, and, and drive, which I, I was so young in my career, I didn't even know how to grow in an organization that was growing that fast, but I feel like you kind of knew and saw the opportunity and recognized it and, and capitalized on it and went from sales manager in Omaha to running the Midwest to Europe, running Europe to back to running North America. And, you know, by the time I think we caught up four or five years after I left LinkedIn, you were like, you know, one of the top 10 people, I feel like in the organization, but um, really was uh, uh, very impressive to, to watch you grow that quickly and with the organization almost in, in line with its pace. And then now you are the chief revenue officer, Rev.com, just relocated from the Chicago area to Austin. And the, the final thing, uh, just introducing Wade, is I feel like one of the things that you are exceptionally talented at is kind of getting things very quickly and like but, but not only getting them, then like elevating them to the actual thing, like the why or the reason, which I absolutely love that. And I feel like that's such a, 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 a skill and, and that you've maybe developed or maybe you were born with, I'm not sure. But in any case, thank you for being here. Uh, thanks for giving us this time. For those of you who are not muted, please make sure that you are, are muted. Um, and, uh, you know, for, for Thanks for joining again, Wade. So if you wouldn't mind, just kind of introduce yourself. I'm sure I did it in, in a way that's not completely accurate, but uh, yeah, tell us, say, you know, how are you and and uh, who is Wade Burgess, if you wouldn't mind just doing kind of a proper intro of yourself. Yeah, happy to do it. There's a lot there, Patrick. And you have like an actual fire at the fireside chat. That's pretty impressive, I have to say. Gotta have uh, it. Yeah, that somebody, did, somebody clued you in that that was a good idea. Um, and for context of this, by the way, Patrick and I used to work together at LinkedIn. Um, oh gosh, I don't know, like a long time ago. Uh, I know I started there 2008, so you know, back when the world was flat, kind of thing. And um, yeah, it's interesting. There's there's a lot in what you said. Uh, I'll I'll start with this. Like I think like pain is a wonderful teacher. And I, I personally think that I've learned a lot more in the valley and on the like you know, challenging slopes going up than, than on any sort of mountain top, top or, the, or the, you know, downward trek. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll start with that. Like I, I probably, for most people who know me, I think most significant like run in my career was at LinkedIn. I started as an individual contributor in Omaha, Nebraska, like, you know, with a bag and a territory and a Salesforce login. And then ultimately over about nine and a half years there, ended up, you know, having some other roles, um, I don't know, eight, nine, 10, quite a few of them, um, some in the US, some internationally, and then ultimately ended up running a global line of business there with about 3,000 employees, a little over 3 billion in revenue. Um, so that was, a, that was a pretty meteoric run and it was, it was fantastic. But, uh, and, and uh, I credit so many people that I, you know, I worked with with that success. But I actually think you brought up something interesting. So to me, um, I think, you know, success occurs when preparedness and opportunity meet. And by the way, I, I wouldn't point to myself as a success. I feel like I'm, you know, just getting started in, in life. 
And uh, there's a lot, there's a lot ahead of me, but, but what I've so far, you know, the pattern recognition has been that it's the challenging times and the failures is what you, you learn from. And oh, if you learn from them, you know, the idea that uh, I've really been fortunate in having good mentors and sought them out from early age. And one mentor of mine talked to me about the fact that like experience is not the best teacher. Everyone says experience is the best teacher. He's like, not true. Evaluated experience is the best teacher. And just like if someone's going to be on stage or you know, like an athlete or a singer or a speaker or whatever, like probably your best coach is a camera. Because if you ever watch yourself, you go back and look at recording, you're like, oh God, that was terrible. You know, like, um, but the same is true going through experiences for me and evaluating those. And so I think the, the reason that, that LinkedIn window was a successful run was because of you know, the things that had happened prior to that. Most of the times when companies go from one phase to another to another, it requires different types of people. You know, the sort of jungle and then dirt road and then highway uh, all require different um, skill sets. But you've gone through enough cycles, you can actually make some of those jumps, you know, along the way. So it was an incredible journey, but I think a lot of it was due to the things that people don't know about me. Yeah, that, okay. Uh, and um, what, what uh, I, you know, I guess, what were you doing before LinkedIn? And, and I, I think you were actually in like the office next to us. <laughs> was, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, gosh, how do I do this story? Um, let me try and summarize the fact that like, so I, like I grew up on a ranch in the middle of nowhere when I was a kid in Missouri, like raised cattle. And the only people I was around was primarily my family. There's, there are five kids. I'm the fourth of five. There's like four boys and a girl. And so socialization was about that group. And then like, you know, once or twice a month, we would go to the town of 800 people. And so, and then eventually a small town in Nebraska, I grew up there. And then, um, Fast forward to what, like, went to school for mechanical engineering, never, never used it, um, started a construction company. Uh, my brother and I, like various ones with moderate levels of failure, some successes, and then got into technology sales. And then when, it, you know, I, I found that um, different new technologies being applied to businesses had a lot of value. I'm a big believer in entrepreneurship. And so I was with an ISP. And then my biggest customer was a data center. And so the data center people hired me. And I found that relationships matter, the way you conduct yourself, your character, all of that. And so since then, since that second real, real job in technology, I've never put a resume together. I've never like, you know, proactively looked for a job. And <clears throat> going through different series of steps there, it was like, um, I, I ended up in a, at one stage in a sales management role for a computer training company, a franchise called New Horizons. At the time, they were the biggest in the world. And they taught things like Cisco certifications, Microsoft certifications. That was a big deal at that time um, in this little strip mall in Omaha, Nebraska. And it was a, like, it was a decent experience, but I had a, a good lesson in how to be a terrible manager <laughs> and someone who treated like really, uh, I feel like uh, handled a situation very poorly. And so I, I ended up exiting there, ended up doing a startup and then got recruited to LinkedIn, which was several years later, back to that same strip mall. Okay. So, and that's where Patrick, that's where you and I met, was in that place, that first, you know, LinkedIn Omaha office of what, a couple dozen people or something like that? Yeah. 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 And I, I wish, uh, I mean, at the time I was like, uh, uh, I don't know, bright eyed and bushy tailed, not that I'm still not, but I really didn't know what was what. I mean, I didn't know the difference between a, a sales job and a customer service job or a marketing job. I just knew that I wanted to like level up. And um, I mean, you were probably, if I could go back, I probably would have like moved my cubicle closer to yours just so I could have gotten more exposure to uh, the sales because it took me another 10 years before I ever learned how to sell something. Um, it, it actually took me, I had my last, my last business. I still didn't need to learn how to sell because I was surrounded by great salespeople. It took this business before I really learned you know, what it takes to be an effective salesperson, which I think kind of leads me to my next question, which is like, what were the, what were those hard lessons? Like, what was, what are some of the, if there was like an uh, inflection point or a point where you learned something that you're like, like a light bulb went off and you're like, I, you know, you, I don't know, they, what, what, what were the things that you learned or that hardened you or, 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 or helped you get to the next level? Uh, because I feel like I'm still, I'm still down here now. I've made it to salesperson, good, yeah, pretty good salesperson, but you're like at the top of the mountain. Well, I think, um, 
I would argue there's probably not a mountain, but uh, I'm, I'm a big believer in Sheryl Sandberg's principle of like jungle field, not ladder. Um, th that being said, uh, you know, I actually never, I think I really didn't understand sales. I always thought sales was like talking someone into buying something. That was the way I'd always grown up around it. You think about the stereotypical, you know, that, you know, used car sales. I mean, that, that, that stereotypical sales person convincing someone to buy something they didn't really want to part their money for. And, you know, I, I later realized that was false. Um, so, you know, I mentioned like, I kind of have an engineering mindset. I thought that the idea was you build a great product. That is the thing. And certainly great products matter. But, you know, there are many mediocre products have done historically well, you know, like mediocre, well, I guess. And um, so I think probably a couple of lessons. One was one of the reasons that our, our residential and commercial construction companies that my, my brother and other partners and I ran failed was we didn't know how to sell. And I know I didn't put that together. And so I realized there's a skill set I'm going to need to have. And it's that moment where a buyer and seller meet. And so I looked at it analytically and said, there, there has to be, it can't just be art. It has, there has to be some science there. And this is when, this dates me a lot, but internet service providers were just starting to sell to businesses. And that's, I, you know, I got my first sale job there, but I'd had enough repetitions. I always had, I've always been like a hard worker. And so I've almost always had at least one side hustle, if not more. And I had worked since I was 19. I had like a direct sales business and really just going through and I had to do a bunch of pitches. And I was, you know, multiple times a week, probably Malcolm Gladwell's, you know, theory of 10,000 reps. I don't know how many times I've been in front of people and been told no. And been rejected and realized that like, that was terrible and awkward and humiliating and I'm not good at this and I'm nervous and like, I don't know how to answer to that objection. And I went through, I don't know how many times and then going back to the drawing board and trying to solve it. Those are the things I think where I really learned the skills and then seeking out mentors and, you know, going to functions and, you know, listening to audios or podcasts or just something, just like putting things in, not because the whole thing was good because I got one line that worked. And I really think it's when your stomach and your backbone meet that motivation happens, you know, like you're hungry and you've got to figure it out. Um, those, those things helped a lot. And then I think, you know, another lesson was when I realized that selling is about finding somebody who has a need and filling that need. The best buying experience, you're happy to pay for it. You know, and you create the value in a way that improves someone's life in such a way it, it, they, they can't imagine living without that thing or it improves that, you know, if you think about the fact that we all spend a thousand dollars for a bunch of glass and brick. 20 years ago, no one would have ever thought you'd spend that much money for a mobile device. But the amount of value that they've created and the way they've convinced us that that's a good idea, um, that, that really, I think, the sales is identifying opportunity and connecting the buyer who will benefit greatly. The, the best transaction is one where both parties walk from the away from the table feeling like that they got the better deal. And then finally, I think I'd say, I, you know, for me, I found a way that my the math and the, and the, or the science and the art met. Because I, I really like the fact that there is a science, there's a way to do things that work very well. And when you do the right things, the right things happen. You don't have to be this charismatic person. You don't have to be, you know, like devilishly good looking. You basically have to be able to ask the right questions, identify needs and be able to present value against those needs. And to be able, you know, to be a good person in the process. Do you, do you um, have you used, have you hired on your own? I know you've mentioned mentors, but do you use coaches for yourself? Do you, do you, do you, do you, do you still, do you still go to people for coaching or for help? Um, or do you, is it, is it books? Like where do you draw a lot of your um, insights or, or your own growth from now? Yeah, all, all the time. So um, I try, you know, my, my reading habits aren't what they need to to be, to be really honest with you, but for most of the growth time, you know, I, I have a discipline of reading like every day um, from something I think I can get value from. And there, there's a lot to be said, I believe, actually, for reading. I'm trying to discipline myself to get back into paper books instead of digital books. But, um, you know, I, I don't think I've gone more than three days in my life without reading. You know, my, my discipline habit is like 15 to 30 minutes a day, no matter what, of something that's going to benefit me, even if it's just a little bit. Um, so, so there's that. I do listen to a lot of audio. Um, when I was driving, when I lived in places like Nebraska and other places and driving a lot, I listened to a ton of audio. It's a great commute time thing. 
and um, seeking out mentors and anyone I can learn from. By the way, that doesn't mean someone who is like amazing and done something really wonderful. Like the first real sales mentor I had was fantastic. And I met him through my brother, you know, he had like, you know, a private jet and a bunch of money. And I was super impressed with that at age 19 years old. But the next real like sales manager, I said, what's the hardest thing about selling? And I went back to that idea that I think used cars is a hard thing because it's like the Scott stereotype. So I reached out to the person who ran at the time, the largest uh, vehicle sales organization in, in Omaha area, Bob Woodhouse, and um, just said, hey, I'm a young sales manager trying to learn sales management. Would you sit down and meet with me and sit down with a legal pad and you know, fill out 10 pages and um, from what I got from him. Um, since then, I found that there are clearly a lot more people who are, there are companies and consultants and advisors you can go to for specific things you're trying to solve. That's a much more like, I have a problem, I need to solve it, much more practical. But I still do, I have a personal board of advisors, uh, you know, that I talk to at least once a month, each of them, and in all different aspects of my life. Finally, coming in for landing on the topic, I learn a lot from uh, people in my organization. Like I, I aspire to hire people better at everything of that function than I am. So when you hire people better than you, people you probably should be reporting to, it's a very enlightening thing. As long as you get your ego out of the way, you can learn from them. And I learn all the time from people, um, you know, probably the most, the most compressed cycle of learning for me was I lived in London. I'd moved from Omaha, Nebraska. I'd never done any business outside of the US or Canada. Sold my house, cars, everything. Moved with three kids, you know, to London and went and, you know, opened up offices. And I don't know, we opened up maybe 11, 12 countries at that time or something. I only speak one language. Um, and then ultimately I ended up with a global role. And I found myself sitting in play, you know, cities around the world with people who knew culture, experiences, cut everything much better than I did. And, and I finally like learned to just shut up and listen. Like, how do I operate here? What do I need to know? And I think you can learn as much, you know, if you're a leader, I think you can learn as much from people, you know, downline from you in your organization as you can from others. And then reaching out to someone outside of your context is really helpful too, because we get, we get stuck in our own little world, in our own little vortex. Yeah, blinders on. Um, do you do you think uh, that sales has changed for, for you? And and I mean, I mean, LinkedIn is one example of uh, of, of, a, of a, a I would consider it a game changer for salespeople. Not that it makes your calls or your opportunities convert better, but it has changed the sales process and the way in which we connect and maintain relationships and, and do things. But do, do you think that, uh, that, that, that there are parts of the parts of technology, parts of the way people are selling today that make them, you know, I guess, I guess that, that, have, that would make you better today than five or 10 years ago, or is it, you know, is it still salespeople or a great salesperson, still a great salesperson or what role does, technology play and uh, I guess for you or for your teams, like in, in making them better. Yeah. Oh, for sure. I mean, like people are people. And when all said and done, you're going to buy, you know, all things being equal, people will buy from someone they like. All things not being equal, they'll still buy from someone they like. And like, you know, keeping this a family channel, don't be a jerk. And there was a time like rewind, I don't know how many years ago, 20, 30 years ago, it would be okay to go into a company and say, what do you guys do here? Like imagine in the world of the internet doing that, right? Today, you better have researched what's going on. Well, now fast forward to what LinkedIn did is it created that same thing for personal relationships. If you meet someone for the first time and you're asking questions that are on their LinkedIn profile, are you kidding me? That is an arrogant, uh, uninformed way to start a conversation. And I think, you know, the more insights you can get to a company, to the person, show enough respect to know something about them, you're going to have some sort of mutual areas of overlap and interest. I think it's really important. I think also, you know, the commodity today is the most scarce is time. And respecting that other person enough to, you know, get to the nugget, this is, you're not in the conversation to schmooze them. You're not in the conversation to win them over to, you know, marry you. Like you're in a conversation to connect quickly, be competent about the conversation, be competent about them, be compassionate about the relationship, help solve something. Yes or no are both equally valuable. 
like I think we come in like a consultant to determine if is what I'm representing of value here is there does one plus one equal more than two? If not, be honest about it. And then back to the relationships matter, your your brand and your reputation, you as a reputation of one, the startup of you, comes across in a certain way to that person. They may or may not be the person that buys from you today. But you're going to maintain that relationship. And I can't tell, I mean, I think probably most people here have had the example of you conducted yourself well in some interaction. It didn't go favorably the way you wanted it to. Three years later, that was your person who hired you, or that was the person you sold to, or it was there's value in that. And like you're building your own brand, not just the brand of the company or service you happen to represent at the moment. Yeah, yeah. And I, I've seen you I, in your, you know, you 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 have some very uh, prolific uh, uh, updates on. I mean, you're like I I, it, I would think you were, you read a book every night based on like the amount of intelligence you share on on uh, LinkedIn and and even your comments sometimes are like ele elevating things. But I've seen you getting into some, uh, I don't want to call it like debate, but I've seen you challenge a lot of the, the, the change that people are saying COVID is going to have on, you know, on society and on, on companies and permanently working from home. And is this changing everything for the future? And, and I mean, now we've got a vaccine, so there's a lot of new information available just in the last, you know, week or two. But um, what is your, what is your stance on I, it, it's kind of like to me it's sort of like a boring question I hate asking it but I'm also curious like do you think COVID is going to change the way that business is done and, and that people are got, not going to go into the office anymore or sales is going to change I mean what do you think are, are there lasting changes coming from this is it impacting you is it going to change the way that you do things I feel like I'd answer I could answer like a fortune cookie you know like fortune cookie writers are always right you know they're going to have good times <laughs> <the> time. <laughs> um this is my personal opinion. It could be totally wrong. I've been wrong a lot. I've been wrong more often than right, I think. Um, but you know, you just need a few at bats. So um, my take on it is this: I think that this global pandemic has accelerated many trends that were already in place. So, I, so right now, by the way, this is not about the compassion for the human race and the suffering going on right now. That is absolutely real, and I think it's actually more important than the topic of how business is going to handle it. Yeah. And, and I don't mean I don't mean the number of people who are getting sick and the number of people who are dying. That's clearly tragic. Uh, well, illness isn't tragic, death is. But the mental health issues, the domestic abuse issues, the substance abuse. There's a lot going on in the world that is like really catastrophic right now, driven by isolation, driven by loneliness, driven by lack of interaction with other people. There is a um, psychological and emotional damage that is like, I don't know when that gets repaired enough. But if I know, you know, anything about if history tells anything about the human race is that the human race is pretty resilient and recovers from these macro things even materially better than they went into them with, whether that be global wars, whether that be health related issues, whether it be natural disasters, you know, this historically is not as big of a deal as we currently think it is the biggest deal we've faced. And I think there's a lot of what my perspective, you talk about my comments and that, I try to zoom out. I actually have a working title of a book that I started and I've never come back to, um, but it's, the working title is Zoom Out. That the idea that the perspective that you have on things, like this is the most significant thing that's happened probably in most of our lifetime to the world, but probably not in the last hundred years, and certainly not in the last thousand years, and for sure not in the last 10,000 years, right? So it just depends on how you look at it. But I think business-wise, coming back to your practical answer, yeah, like this, you know, it, it's, it's fast forward a lot of things. Being able to work from anywhere, you know, early in my career, I was selling, uh, uh, you know, IP telephony software where you could have a soft phone on your laptop and work from your desk or your, you know, your desk at home as if you were in the office. And it was like a miracle. And we're like, this is going to be great. Cities are going to go away. Everybody's going to live in the middle of Montana, wherever they want to. And telecommuting is going to be the thing. And like, it didn't happen. And then... Skype was going to do the same thing and like all that well suddenly all of us this meeting we're in right now um you know everybody's living this way I was shocked I it's funny because the idea of like zoom meetings and you know blue jeans and whatever the technology is I've been doing that for 10 years so like looking at a screen of people and time zones all over the world and interacting with them it's just normal for me and I realized wow that is not normal for most people it's been hard for them to adjust to so we'll see things like that clearly we're going to see companies realizing that oh it turns out people don't have to physically be together where I'm a contrarian, 
is I actually think people want to be together sometimes. Yeah, I, I also don't like long commutes. You know, I living in Chicago, it was an hour 15 door to door for me each way, uh, mostly on a train, so I was productive most of the time. But yeah, I don't like those either. But I can tell you something magical happens when you get human beings together, especially in an unstructured way for some window of time. The office, Patrick, you and I met in, you know, while it was a startup and it was mostly a support type of office, still just the buzz in that room when you had a company that was going from here that became like, you know, ended up selling for $26.2 billion. I mean, I can't imagine the same buzz if we were all just interacting like this. I, I wouldn't know you. I would not know you. I would, I would know you as a, as a box on a screen, but I wouldn't actually know you. Yeah. So I, I think that, you know, we're tribal in nature. And I think we will continue to circle back into tribes. And I think that will happen professionally as well. And I think that there'll be good value to that. I, I'm hopeful that we take the best lessons from this and say, that doesn't mean we have to sit nine to five in symmetrical cubicle rows and you know, like all of that. Hopefully we can get past that. I think creating human experiences where they come together um, is, is gonna be really important. I also hope that the idea that hierarchy starts to get flattened out. I, what I love about this, this type of way we're interacting right now is you can have the CEO of a Fortune 100 company and you can have a temporary receptionist of a startup and they're both having a conversation in each other's home. And one yeah. of them's got a dog running back here and the other one's got a kid screaming and the other one has plumbers outside making a bunch of noise. It levels the playing field so that we're, we're bringing our human selves forward. And I think the more personalized we can become in the way we interact, the less fake, the less corporate, you know, mask kind of thing we have, the better. So that uh, I'm hopeful we'll end up, you know, benefiting society. But, you know, to be a little bit skeptical, human nature is human nature. So we're still going to have divide. You know, we see that right now. And, and but I'm, I'm hopeful once we get past this, we will see a lot more, um, you know, collaboration, whether it's this way or, or physically. Cool. Good, good stuff. Um, I, I, I have a, a, a set of other things I can ask you. I want to see Coop, are there any questions or, or does anybody want to raise their hand and jump in? and ask Wade a question. I have one that I had written down and there are others that are coming through. I just put it in the chat that if you have questions to message me and I can ask on your behalf or you can ask it by unmuting yourself. So please let me know. But Wade, first and foremost, thanks for you know joining us today and just you know being together with us. My question to you is what did you specifically focus on early in your career to accelerate your professional growth? Uh, it's a really good question. Mostly me. Uh, and what I mean by that is my observation was like most of the problems, most of the limitations of my growth were the way I reacted to things. Uh, emotion, you know, whether it was, you know, I was disappointing in something or angry at something or not, you know, addressing something right. Um, so it really worked on me and that's where a lot of reading came in, but um, also just numbers of repetitions. It was like, you can't replace a good work ethic. And the three things that I think I focus on the most, other than like the tactical skill of whatever you do, you better be the best at it. And I, I got into the weeds of knowing, like people who know me now are like, you never a detail person. I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. Like I, I was into the knit of everything. So, cause I wanted to know it better than someone else so that I could represent it well. But the three things that I really focus on, one was a solid work ethic and I was fortunate to have been raised that way, but you can outwork a lot of problems. In sales, it is a numbers game. And I can tell you that if you run X number of numbers, you're gonna get results and they'll get better over time. But if you don't do enough cycles, you're never gonna be successful. You know, it's kind of, excuse me, if you were, if I was a physical trainer, which I'm not, unfortunately, but, in, and you were to come to my gym, the first thing I would measure is like, how often you come? I don't care how good your form is. I don't care where you're like, are you there? And then are you doing the right things? Are you doing enough of those things? And then we'd get to, are you good at those things? So, so that, you know, that activity metric. The second thing is attitude. Um, I really had to work on my attitude because I'm kind of a smart aleck and kind of cynical. And, you know, like I, it's just sort of like the way I was raised. And what I found is that like, that's actually not helpful. And subconscious mind can't take a joke. And one of the best ways to empower other people is to empower other people, to think and speak things that are, that are good into them. And I don't mean attitude like, you know, fake smiles and doing backflips in the office every day, that's fine. But attitude is, um, brief story about attitude, two twin boys. One of them's always positive, one of them's always negative. The parents are like, okay, we're gonna do a social study here. 
we're going to give the, the kid who's always positive <clears throat> for his birthday, we're going to give him a big box of horse manure. And the other kid, we're going to give him everything he always wanted. So the kids get up for their birthday and they go downstairs and sure enough, the kid who's always negative, he has all these toys and things. And by that, he's already complaining. This one's the wrong color and the batteries don't work on this. And he's moaning, complaining. In the other kid's bedroom, they hear him jumping up and down, all excited and laughing. They go up, he is head first in this big box of manure is flying everywhere. And they said, what are you doing? And he says, well, all this manure, there's gotta be a pony in here somewhere. <laughs> you know, that, that to me is attitude. Like I'm always looking for the pony. And that, I worked on that a lot because I'm not that way by nature. Um, so work ethic, attitude, and then a big dream. You know, the other thing, I think most of us think too small. And there is magic in thinking big. There's actually a book by a guy named David Swartz called The Magic of Thinking Big. And the idea of when someone is thinking about 10 and you think, why not 100? It changes your framework. In sales, it's like usually there's these tactical nitpicky things that you're focused on probably have nothing to do with what that organization actually needs. And like zooming out, thinking bigger helps a lot. So I, I had to work on those because those were weaknesses of mine, except for the work ethic. The other ones were weaknesses. And so those I really focused on. Uh, Go ahead, Patrick. I, well, I'm guessing it, there's some, 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 some of those are shared, but when you're hiring other people and I guess particularly salespeople, what do you look for in a salesperson? I'm sure, again, I'm sure some of those things carry over, but what are some of the other things that you look for that you think make a great salesperson versus, you know, like a top performer versus uh, somebody who's, who's not such a top performer? Work ethic. <laughs> those, those, are, those are my top ones for sure. Integrity is one that you can't interview for, but I really look for gaps in that. Yeah. Um, I, I typically have a one question interview. It's not really a one question interview, but I'm a guy named Lou Adler, um, who's been a mentor of mine in hiring. And Lou for years has been one of the best at this. You basically, I, I ask a question similar to, you know, tell me about your most significant professional accomplishment. And they give you some kind of an answer. And then you drill down into that. And how did that happen? And who helped you with it? And, and ultimately I look for people who take credit for what someone else did. I look for someone who kind of got lucky I look for people who rode a wave, didn't make a wave. You know, those are things that I look, th those are traits I don't like, by the way. Those are <laughs> traits I try not to find. Integrity is a big thing. I, um, I want somebody who's going to show up and going to do the work and is going to be humble enough to do it. I also think it's a mistake that a lot of people think salespeople, again, are like influential, charismatic. There's this, you know, unfortunately, sales, most of tech sales, which is where my focus has been, has this real bro culture of, male extroverted type a personality you know back in the day when it was you know sales was like smoking cigars golfing and whatever drinking you know like that's not the way it's done so i i really look for people who are humble people who um, can think before they speak people who are compassionate towards other people so i look for those traits that aren't like always stereotypically associated with the salesperson cool um, any questions from the group? If not, I'll, I will keep rolling. No, we did have a couple come through here. Uh, James from Team Nerdwise, go ahead, unmute yourself and ask away. Thanks, Coop. Wade, it's nice to meet you. James. So, you know, with, with uh, my question is kind of just surrounding, um, you know, some of your experiences and um, with this day and age and everything that's going on, what would you recommend to somebody that's just starting out, whether they're graduating college, high school, or, or neither, they're just starting out in the workforce in 2020, what would you recommend to them? Um, where you can shadow somebody good. You know, I think- I like that. Most important like thing, that. you know, spend time with them. I, I uh, you know, in the days where you could actually do ride-alongs where you can join meetings, I'll like shadow somebody good um, and look for people to critique and then get a bunch of reps in. Whether you're good at it or not, you know, get as many repetitions as you can. Um, I, you know, I, I've always felt like one of, the, one of the mistakes we make, especially in sales, but one of the mistakes we make is relying on other people for our success. So like, well, I don't have enough leads or, you know, like, um, I don't know, like, look out the window. There's a lot of businesses out there. So find ways to get enough repetitions in because failures are, is, is a good teacher as well. But the, the final other thing I would say on that, James, is like, it's 
really digging into knowing the product. As trivial as that sounds, a lot of salespeople have earned the reputation of clueless salesperson like they've earned it. Because they don't know the detail of the product or of the competitive landscape, or whatever it is you're trying to do. Um, but I think even just generally as a professional, like finding a pro and shadowing them. Coop, next up. Yeah, this next one is from Lauren. Uh, Lauren writes in, Wade, what would you, what advice would you give yourself early in your career to advance yourself sooner rather than later? So different than the work ethic, the attitude and the big dream, any other advice you might give yourself, some wisdom nuggets? I think I wrote a post about this one time, what I'd tell my 22 year old self or something. Um, I don't remember what I said. So <clears throat> one of the things I would say to, to me personally, so everyone has their own personality. One of the things I would say to me is like, step off. I was very opinionated. I thought my ideas were right. Well, I was sure they were. I mean, they were obviously right because I could tell. Um, but I think stepping off of my own perception of what was right and wrong. Um, and I don't mean ethics wise. I just mean, you know, um, of how things should be done. Um, being humble, learning, listening, those kind of things, like really important. Also being willing to admit failure. I, I didn't, um, I kind of sidestepped it. You know, it's one of those, like when you trip and you're looking around and nobody saw you, you kind of act like nothing happened. Um, I tended to do that. And I think a little bit of, I, I probably had, and I think a lot of people have this, an imposter syndrome, where I work my butt off and getting into opportunity so I could pursue that opportunity. On paper, I was almost never qualified. And so, it, and, and by the way, that wasn't just early in my career. Like, I can remember one time I was at LinkedIn, I was sitting inside a modernization meeting with, you know, the C-level people of the company. And... These are people who are like, you know, Wharton MBAs and like super whip smart people, the best people in Silicon Valley. And, you know, I'm this kid from like Nebraska who went to school basically to wrestle and um, didn't have any of the sort of life experiences they had. And I looked around the room and realized like it was the first moment of me first at the first time realizing that I felt like I belonged there. But up until that point, I hadn't. So I think it's important to like cut yourself some slack and, you know, realize that, um, you do belong and invest in your, be humble. But I mean, like give yourself some credit for who you are and be your, the final thing I would say is like, be your authentic self, bring your authentic self to the table. We, for whatever reason, think we have to be like other people. We have to fit in with other people and we have to think, say, and believe the same way they believe. Not true. You're going to be best when you're authentically you. I mean, like, don't be a jerk. Don't treat other people poorly. I just mean like, you, I, I'll give you an example of this. This may not be a popular way to thing to talk about, but I moved from Chicago to Austin recently. And <clears throat> Chicago is, I mean, I love the city. It's so much of a fun city, but I have to tell you, it's a really easy place not to live right now. It's politically a mess. It's very polarized. It, weather's bad, <laughs> like economically. Much, and, but one of the things I noticed when I came to Austin and I came down right during the heat of this like political election in the US right now, um, you know, that. But here, this is like a, you know, a, like a blue dot in a red state. And I found it very uh, like liberating. Most people here that I see, they have friends and know people who think very differently than they do. And they can have a civil discussion about who they are, what they believe and why. They're not like fighting in the streets. They're not arguing about, it. they're like most, this isn't entirely true, but mostly having discussion about it. And that can be true of any that was having to be political, but in other areas, I think realizing that like bring your authentic self, respect other people's beliefs, but like be you. And um, I think that helps a lot early on because we, we somehow have this belief that we have to be like the other people that we work with or that we interact with. And I think that's simply not true. If you're in an organization that doesn't accept you for who you are, I'd question that. And I'd look for one that does. Um, separate from, from work, and, and I know you used to run marathons, or I, I remember you ran like the DC marathon. Do you have things that you, your, your, your routines, your, uh, I think Tony Robbins calls them rituals or things. Do you, do you have things that you do that keep you, you know, performing high energy, balanced, sane, you know, what are your, what are your routines? What are your habits that, uh, that keep you on? 
Uh, yeah, good question. You're assuming that I'm balanced. Uh, <laughs> so I, I go through this weekly. I go through this weekly exercise um, that is the. I have roles and goals. So there's roles in my life that I have, and in those roles, I have a goal every week for them. So, you know, as a father, as a husband, as like all these other things. Um, and then I also have parts of my life. So physical, mental, spiritual, um, financial, and each one of those, I have, you know, basically habits that I try to institute into my life to be healthy in those, in those areas. Um, physically, I, you know, I, I do have a reasonable fitness routine right now. It's been a little weird, obviously during, during COVID, although now I'm in a climate where I can run every day and I can lift and stuff. And, and there's that, but the one that has me the most, the most tweaked lately of getting back into um, is flying. So I tried to retire once and uh, I realized I was 47 when I did it. And I realized that like, I don't idle well. So uh, I got, I went and got my pilot's license and do that. So that's one, it's just completely different than what I do professionally. It's intellectually challenging. Costs of being bad at it are high, <laughs> you know, like there, there's a certain set of things you have to be able to do well as a pilot and like take off and land are the two main ones. But yeah, it's that. And maybe that's just an example of like, I always try to have um, something that I have, I'm not sure how to do yet. And so I'm in a process right now of trying to learn to speak Spanish. I only speak one language. And so just that new challenge, my, I have sort of, you know, professional ADD and I have to have that next thing to sell for. Um, there's, there's actually a picture somewhere when I was in London, one of the people I've worked with, a guy named Rob Fox, his wife was a great photographer. And, and I happened to be in a conference room juggling uh, Rubik's Cube, uh, Rubik's Cubes, yeah, Rubik's Cubes. And she took this photo, black and white photo, and then colored the cubes. And it was like, it was the story of my life in a picture. One of the cubes was like perfectly put together. The other one was coming together and the other one was a total mess. And so I always try and have it like get the main stuff pretty sorted out, some things coming together. And then I always, try and pursue something I don't know how to do yet. And so physically also, um, I try to always have something I'm not sure how to do yet. Always learning. Um, yeah. Other questions from the group, Coop? Yeah, this one's coming uh, from David Trapani. So Wade, why do you think most salespeople struggle doing their daily activities? For example, the lack of prospecting regularly. Well, uh, the easy answer is they're lazy. That's usually, I mean, that, that's actually sometimes totally true. You know, our society does not teach people work ethic, unfortunately. Um, it teaches you how to do the minimum to get by. And, and if you're naturally gifted, it's even worse. Like if you're naturally smart in school, you, you need like a third of your brain and get through it and it's easy because it's geared for the caboose, All right? And most things like that, if you're naturally gifted in sports, you do really well in like, you know, little league superhero, you know, but you never make it to the pros. Um, so I think work at, you know, that, that laziness is a thing. But usually I don't think it's laziness. I think it's fear and insecurity. Selling is hard. Mostly selling is rejecting, you know, being rejected. And like, imagine a dating scenario where you got told no, like eight out of 10 times. Pretty soon you're like, forget it. That, that's, wait, that's not normal? Hey, sorry, man, no offense. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I just filtered so many comments. I'm really proud of myself, Patrick. <laughs> But yeah, I, I think that, that that usually is that. The other thing is, I think it's lazy management. I blame, so and I'm putting myself in the category, I believe that's, that uh, poor sales management is um, rampant because a lot of times people think you're, you're an uh, individual contributor and then you become a manager and then you just like coast on other people selling, which couldn't be further from the truth. And the skills of selling, skills of managing are very different. And lazy sales management where they're basically saying, let's do your pipeline review and I want to see your numbers and go do more next week is completely ineffective at helping somebody be better. So if you don't have a manager who's investing in you and helping you do the right things and encouraging you to do more or someone who's causing you to stretch for that one, it's like having a trainer that encourages you to do that one more rep. Most people don't have that. They have somebody who basically is looking at their forecast every week and criticizing them for not closing that deal they said they were going to close. So if you look at the condition response over time, you end up basically uh, not performing well. So I think, I think some of it is that, but you know, you have to realize you have to keep your eye on what the end result is. Like back to the fitness analogy, usually most of us don't feel like working out. So like, man, I feel like it's 5.30 in the morning. Can't wait to get out of bed. 
It doesn't happen that way, at least to me. Um, but you have to like the result. You have to, is that, I would say, finally, I would say we measure the wrong things. In sales, a lot of times we, we feel like we had a successful day if we close a deal. And that's like measuring the harvest, where really success is a successful day is if you did the right things, if you planted the right seeds. If you did the right things, you had a successful day. You feel good about it, you create the wins and you get the dopamine hits from, you know, you have to, I think you have to train yourself to get those positive creds for doing the right things, not for what you received. It's a really great analogy. Uh, uh, I, am, I am the most guilty of feeling like I got enough deals for the week and then calling it good. Um, and then moving on to the moving on to the other activities that have nothing to do with sales, <laughs> but but that's a good uh, that that's spot on. Um, yeah, I, one one more thing just on that on that note, Patrick. Like the you know success is probably the biggest enemy here of of more success because you feel like if the number was ten and you're at ten, you're like yes, and if you're eleven, you're like it's awesome. The reality is you could probably do twenty five. We just aren't wired to think that way. Yeah. Coop, anything else? Yeah, we absolutely do. And it goes back, you got to have those big dreams, those big goals. So if we're shooting for five, maybe we should be shooting for 15. Because if you fall short, you've already exceeded your initial expectations. Yeah. Um, so love that stuff. There is, there's a, another question coming from Dana from Team Nerdwise. And wait, how are you encouraging others to maintain or build relationships with colleagues while everything is done virtually on these Zoom calls? Um, yeah, a couple of ways. Uh, I think it's important to make you know conscious efforts to reach out. And there's technology that does it. If you're using Slack, it's like Donut, which like automatically creates random meetings for you, and you do five minute virtual coffees and all that. That's that's fine. I don't mean to, to dismiss those things. And those little light touches are fine. I personally find them to be a little bit irritating and wearisome. <laughs> um, so I, I can tell you for me, this: pick up the phone and actually talk to a human being not on video, like we all get Zoom fatigue. Go out for a walk, both of you go for a walk or whatever it is and just make a connection. I wanted to connect as a person. I need a mental break for a second. Do you have five minutes? And I think it's just like those light touches. Um, you know, I right now uh, I've talked to a lot of people the last, I don't know, four or five days. Interesting to me how many people are not getting together with their family for Thanksgiving. And it's just an example of like, wow, tell me about that. And I've learned more about their family and their extended family and the health thing and whatever it is, that's a human connection. You know, the how's the lead flow coming? They get that all the time and they get it over email and Slack and whatever else they're using. So I think it's being a, being a person, like nurturing relationships on purpose. And by the way, don't wait for people to come to you. Be the, I, I find that there's a lot more joy uh, I'm going to get this wrong. I think it's, um, it's a serotonin. What is, there's, there's something our, our brain uh, creates when we give, and there's a different thing than when we receive. I think it's dopamine versus serotonin. I could be totally wrong on that. But when you get something like, yes, got it. And the feeling of that satisfaction goes pretty quickly. If someone gives you a piece of chocolate cake, you're like, awesome. And then you eat it and then you have a big sugar high and then your insulin kicks in and you crash. If you bake a chocolate cake for somebody and you bring it over to your neighbor and you give it to them and we just say, just because that good feeling stays with you much longer is much more sustainable. So if you like nurturing relationships, don't measure it based on what people are giving back to you. Just try to be a giver. Um, and my experience is that that goes a lot further. And I completely agree. It's not always about what you get. It's more about what you give. For sure. Yep. Reach one, teach one, and then get to the next level of success, you know, elevate and don't just fish for people, teach them how to fish and make their own path along this lifelong journey. Yeah, absolutely. By the way, like, don't forget that your customers are people. Yeah. I have, I can tell you how many times I've, relationships have developed by just reaching out and saying, you know, I didn't want anything specific. I just wanted to check in on you and say, how you're doing? Like, this has been a pretty brutal year. I've appreciated, you know, you, you as, as a customer and you as a person, I just wonder how you do it. Like, how you holding up? Mm -hmm. And I also, and I also Go ahead. And I also love your advice about getting away from maybe emails or just text messages. One of the first things I go to is like, stop going and hiding behind a screen, pick up the phone and call and speak with somebody because we all, we all have our own internal filter and narrator. And just because somebody sends something through a text or an email, 
is not maybe the attitude and the authenticity that they're trying to deliver it with. So pick up and actually hear their tonality, hear their pain, hear their excitement, whatever it might be. So I really appreciate that advice because it's, uh, it's something that I tried to do as well. It's so, uh, so spot on. And with, a ne- with especially with negative sentiment, yeah. like anytime there's a disagreement, put you know, back away from the keyboard. Do yeah. not hit send. Yeah. Sometimes we are our own worst enemies in our own minds. So that mindset, that attitude, that desire to be successful and to be optimistic and positive can be conveyed so much easier by just calling and talking to somebody for a couple minutes. Because this could be the devil of, uh, you know, infinity, we'll say. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I found everybody has their own style, but authenticity really helps too. Like when I'm about to make that quick comment back or that text or whatever it is, I find calling him and saying, I got to tell you, I had to pick up the phone because I was about to send something I thought would be misinterpreted. Yep. And I, I, I probably, I don't know if I misread your message, but I got to tell you, like, I'm not in a good place. And I just felt like it's better for us to talk about it than for me to be that. Even if I violently disagree with what they just said, starting in that way, taking the, you know, falling on sword a little bit. Um, even if your goal is just to win, that is an advantageous way to I think, enter a conversation. Um, I, uh, I have, I have two, Coop, unless there's other questions in the queue, I got two. So one is, how many push-ups can you do max consecutive? <laughs> do you know? And then, and then my other question is, are there companies or technologies or things that you're excited about right now that you think are the next LinkedIn, the next Airbnb, you know, what, where, what are you excited about and how many push-ups can you do consecutively? Yeah, the context for this conversation is probably 10 years ago, we had a push-up contest in the office that we were in. And well, hold on. Uh, we, we, I had a push-up contest going with someone else at about 45 max, and then you dropped in at about 110 or something. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, and, and I, you know, I was, I was the old guy in the office. I had to prove that, like, it gets better, life's better with time. Um, I don't know consecutive max right now. I know the most recent thing in the last uh, week or two. So I have three teenage sons. <clears throat> and so I'm always physically challenged by them. And so far, um, I've maintained dominance of the, the brood. But uh, so we did it in a minute. So I didn't go as long far as we go as high. So I did 72 in a minute. I have respect. I'll, I'll do that tonight. I'll max out and see what I can do consecutively. <laughs> okay. And then uh, co- companies technologies, things that you see on the horizon that could be the next big thing or that you're excited about? Oh, man, um, there is so much going on right now. It, it's, it's absolutely crazy. You know, I, I switched companies to where I am right now in March. And so I was, I was attempting to take a longer period of time. But so I started, uh, I, I went through probably four months of just like taking inbounds. And it is crazy how much is going on. And I thought, well, surely the pandemic will slow that down. But it hasn't. So <clears throat> I'm not sure where to even start. But what I would end up saying, uh, thanks, Ryan. What I would end up saying is um, probably the best technology right now is two people in a garage with a dog. We have no idea. Like, we don't know that we haven't seen it yet. Um, <laughs> one thing I think is not promising right now is all the copycat social media sites. Uh, I, I can't believe, like, when you know, Twitter just launched um, Fleet, right? Uh, I don't know if you guys have watched that, but I mean, it's the same thing as like Snapchat and Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn that have their stories. And then I look at all these copycats that are doing the same thing. They're launching the same features as all their competitors. Um, that ends up telling me like, boy, that ship has sailed, you know, when you're in this copycat mode. I like seeing some of the things. I think Snowflake was an interesting example of, you know, people believe that the organization and distribution of data uh, and access to data, they, they thought that that had gone long ago. They, Snowflake came in and reinvented the way in which, you know, that, that data could be accessed and thought about. And I think there's more and more of that. I believe that the advances we're seeing right now in telemedicine, there's several of them. Um, there's uh, a company, a guy just, just now, a guy just talked to me about a company called Levels and Levels does um, blood sugar monitoring. And for people who are not diabetic, like I could actually put it on and I could start to look and track at what's going on with when I eat now, when my sugar spikes, what about if I go for a walk afterwards, I can start to pay attention to these things using data. And there are, there are countless number of uh, healthcare and mental health and telehealth startups that I think th- that I believe is going to be one of the biggest next waves. Um, we have a lot of time and attention and money going into healthcare. And I think healthcare technology is really broken. So the category that I see growing the most right now, from my perspective, and I'm, you know, like 
an angel investor and advisor in quite a few companies, but I think it's the reinventions of legacy industries. Healthcare is an example that's ripe for this. I'll tell you another one is real estate. Real estate is fundamentally archaic. Anybody who's bought or sold a home or a property lately knows how ridiculous it is. It is still like you get it in the 1950s. And there are companies out there, Compass and others, that are out there using technology to try and improve you know, that business. So I think it's a lot of those kinds of things that would surprise you, you know, that are you know, convoy, right? you know, the trucking industry, where it's legacy industries being improved by technology. So this is one thing I think it's worth noting if you're a, if you're a tech person. Um, people say, well, I want to join a tech company. Every great company is a tech company. Retailers are tech companies. Education institutions are tech companies, right? I mean, like this year, every academic institution in the world suddenly became a distance learning company. And the advancements in uh, education, I think we all realized this year too that the public education system is broken. And I think we're gonna see a lot of improvements and innovation in that space. That's a long answer to short question, like most of mine, but uh, it's not new categories. I haven't seen new, I, I'm, I'm like looking for a new category because I'm excited about new categories, but it's that. I'll use one more example of legacy industry. Um, several companies I'm invested in are in the town, talent space, recruiting, talent acquisition, and HR space. So specifically for recruiting, obviously, video interviewing is a big thing. And the how you remotely hire, inspire, and fire, all of those things in, in uh, you know, this has been going on forever in human resources, but suddenly that all has to be done differently. And there's tech that's going into those spaces. Yeah. Cool. Um, well, I, I mean, I think we're, we're, we're nearing time here. I will ask you just kind of if somebody wants to get a hold of you, what's the best way to get a hold of Wade Burgess? And uh, also just thank you again, Wade. I mean, awesome to see you. I think it's been three years, four years. I, can't, I don't know how many years, but uh, maybe five. Shit, I, excuse me, I'll have to bleep that. But it's been, it's been a long time, and you, you look the same as 10 years ago at LinkedIn. I feel like nothing's changed. So you're doing something right. That's great. You've got a lot more hair since I you last. But yeah, thanks. And, uh, the, uh, the best way to get a hold of me, just find me on LinkedIn. Wade Burgess on LinkedIn. Send me an, uh, an email uh, there. It's probably the best way. Um, so yeah, I look forward to hearing from anybody. I've got my, my email. Just send it my Gmail. It's first name dot last name. So wade.burgess at Gmail. But uh, I got to tell you, like, I don't check email that much. So uh, LinkedIn's probably better. Hey, thanks again, man. It's great to see you. Uh, and I'll let you know when I'm coming down to Texas or you can make your way down to Puerto Rico. That sounds great. Thanks, you guys. Thanks for having me on. Cheers. Thanks. Bye.